in a quest for the perfect meatball, one woman goes where no one has gone before. Russia. The perfect meatball. The most perfect meatball. 2020 was the year of the perfect meatball. With the world and the lockdown, people wanted comfort food, and my culinary heroes, Alex and Daniel, rose to the challenge to make something truly epic. Alex devoted nine videos to this topic, and I thought it was fantastic that he included the Turkish kofta in his meatball series. I just loved that someone on YouTube was able to see past the cultural boundaries to the heart of the cooking technique. Meatball don't have to be round. Well, I couldn't agree more. And today I'd like to expand the meatball category even further and include the Russian cutlets. Both Daniel and Alex wanted to produce the juiciest meatball. That's a noble cause. But here is the thing. If you put a seriously juicy meatball into a sauce, I don't know if you're showing it off in the best possible light. The sauce is wet, the juice is wet, so there is no contrast. As soon as that meatball is in your mouth, all the wet stuff gets mixed up. But with cutlets, the outside is coated in breadcrumbs, which creates an incredible contrast when you take a bite. So crispness is the first thing I bring to the table. The second thing is practicality. I've made Daniel's meatballs and they were outstanding, but his ingredient list was huge and most of those ingredients needed a lot of prep. I had to make jello, minced jello, freeze pancetta, minced pancetta, grate a ton of parmesan, separate four eggs, and painstakingly mince the onions, garlic, and herbs. I have pretty good knife skills and it still took a long time. I haven't tried Alex's meatballs because they required using dry aged beef, grinding it yourself, and deep frying. That's a recipe for the guys like Guga from Sous Vide Everything, who are going to make something epic once and then never make it again. So in case you've been scared of the perfect meatball, I promise to give you a recipe that's completely accessible and still insanely juicy. Let's start with the meat. I'm using a meatloaf mix that contains beef, pork, and veal. You can buy it in pretty much any American supermarket except for Whole Foods. There are three things that are important here. The most important one is the grind. It needs to be fine and it needs to be uncompressed. See how easily it falls apart? I tried using the same meats, beef, pork, and veal, from a vacuum sealed package and the results were much worse. Since the meats that are organic, grass-fed, or whatever happy terms you want to see on the package don't sell as well, they're usually sold in vacuum-sealed packages because they last way longer that way. Unfortunately, squeezing them into a vacuum-sealed brick ruins the texture in this dish. The next most important thing is the fat content. You need about 20% fat and 80% lean. If you can't find a meatloaf mix and want to use all beef or beef and pork, make sure it's not leaner than 80-20. Of course, in most American supermarkets, the beef fat content is labeled, but the pork is not. But as long as it doesn't say lean on the package, it will probably be around 80-20. If you're buying a meatloaf mix, you don't need to worry about checking the fat content because it's almost guaranteed to be fatty. Veal seems to be a controversial topic. There is no question that veal gives you a softer texture. Everyone seems to agree about that. What people don't agree about is whether it's possible to achieve the same texture by other means. The two biggest arguments for ditching the veal are these. It doesn't have much flavor and it's expensive. The flavor has never been a problem for me because the browning gives the cutlets an insane flavor boost. As far as the price goes, I think it's a lost cause. In order to ditch the veal, Daniel had to add gelatin and pancetta which actually made his meatballs more expensive than if he just used the meatloaf mix with the veal. And on the topic of gelatin, it's a darling of Cook's Illustrated and Serious Eats when it comes to ground meat mixtures. Kanji Lopezal, Daniel Gritza, they all suggest you use it. 
But gelatin has an ugly side that is rarely discussed, although it helps with the juiciness. It causes serious problems with browning. That's why Daniel only lightly broils his meatballs on one side instead of getting them brown all over in a skillet. In a skillet, the gelatin oozes out and forms a terribly unappealing glue that is impossible to separate from the outside of your meatballs. I am all for using gelatin and ground meat fillings for dumplings or stuffed cabbage or in a meatloaf, but in meatballs I prefer to go with veal over gelatin because I really like brownie. Just like all meatballs, this one needs a bread product. It's crucial for texture. Any basic white bread will work here. Cut off the crusts, cut the bread into cubes, and weigh out 90 grams of these cubes. I needed about three and a half slices, but of course all slices are different, that's why we weigh. Add 144 grams of some milk product. I'm using kefir because that's what I have on hand. Buttermilk will work, yogurt will work, even milk will work, but I prefer fermented milk product for its acidity. Any fat content will work. We have plenty of fat in this recipe. Mix your bread and set it aside to soak while you prep the veggies. Since the celery tends to be fibrous, I like to peel the outer layer, but that's up to you. We'll also need some yellow onion, three garlic cloves, a big pile of parsley or parsley dill combo. You can certainly mince it all by hand, but it needs to be incredibly fine and a food processor will save you a ton of time. If you're using a processor, a coarse chop is all you need. We'll also need to dice some butter. This makes the cutlets way more juicy and tender. Make sure your pieces are pretty small. Food processors don't do well with large chunks of butter. Dump all the veggies and herbs in and pulse until you get an even mix. Don't just run the processor. We don't want to juice them. We want to mince them. You'll have to scrape down the sides periodically to keep things even. Here's the texture that I want. It's not a smooth puree. I can still see tiny individual pieces. Add your bread mixture and the butter and pulse until the butter gets to really small pieces. Again, don't forget to scrape down. Here, let me move it into a bowl so that you can see the final texture. See how I still have tiny pieces of butter? Add the meat and salt. Salt makes or breaks any dish and most recipes just wing it. I think that's crazy when it's so easy to get it right. I just weigh 13 grams of salt. If you weigh, the salt type doesn't matter. If you use teaspoons, it does. How much black pepper you add is completely up to you. It won't really affect the taste, just the aroma. When you start mixing, try not to press. Toss everything gently to distribute the bread and veggies evenly throughout the meat. We're trying to prevent the meat proteins from linking up and making the texture bouncy like a sausage. Once you spread things out pretty well, you can start pressing and kneading because all those filler ingredients will prevent our meat proteins from linking up. As soon as your mixture feels homogeneous, you are done. This mixture can be stored in the fridge for up to 24 hours before cooking. I usually shape and cook about half of the mixture right away and save the rest for a meal the next day. It's best not to make your cutlets too big. Small and thin ones cook more evenly than big and thick ones. If it's your first one, you might want to weigh it. I am looking for it to be somewhere between 90 and 100 grams. Roll it into a bowl and then into an oval. Round cutlets are just as tasty as the oval ones, but the oval is a more common shape in Russia. If you see large pieces of butter on the surface, shove them in and re-roll the cutlet. When all the cutlets are shaped, coat them in breadcrumbs. You want to do this right before frying so that the breadcrumbs don't get soggy. I am using the panko breadcrumbs. They are available in any store and produce a far superior crunchy exterior than any other breadcrumbs. Firmly press each cutlet into the breadcrumbs to flatten it out. We really want to thin them out since they'll puff up a lot during cooking. Then flip and press the other side. If I am looking at the meat 
itself. It should be about two thirds of an inch, but panko crumbs are a bit poofy, so the total thickness might look more like three quarters of an inch. To fry them, set a non-stick skillet over medium heat and add a couple of tablespoons of some high heat oil like grapeseed or canola. When the oil starts to shimmer, add the cutlets to the pan and cook for about three minutes. Regulate the heat to get steady and even browning. They tend to brown very quickly, so I would be careful with how high you set your heat. When the first side is brown, flip them over and cook until the second side browns. After they spend five minutes in the skillet, you might want to take the temperature to see where you are at. Make sure you insert the thermometer through the side, otherwise your reading will be completely inaccurate. What we are shooting for here is 155. If you are not quite there but the outside is very brown, reduce the heat to low and give them one more minute on each side. We are at 155 and they are ready to come out. During the rest, they'll get to the well-done temperature of 160. But keep in mind that overcooking is not a huge sin here like it is with burgers. Even if you don't catch that perfect moment, they'll still be juicy. Let them rest for at least five minutes. While the cutlets are resting, I like to put some egg noodles or any pasta into the pan where I cook them to grab all those insanely flavorful brown bits. Hey, it's like Russian spaghetti and meatballs. You see all this glorious juice? It could all be happening in your mouth if you make this dish. Now that we know how to make cutlets without math, let's talk about making cutlets with math. One thing you'll notice when you buy the meatloaf mix in a package is that it's hard to get exactly two pounds. I wrote my recipe for two pounds of meat because most of my audience is in the US and that was a nice round number that produced eight portions or two meals for four people. But the amount of meat I had in those two packages was actually 2.6 of a pound and normally I would use it all. If you are comfortable with percentages, it's very easy. If not, let me explain what to punch into your calculator. I promise it's not rocket science. Here are the measurements you'll find in the description below the video. All the measurements are calculated based on the weight of meat. So my meat weight is 100%. If I have 900 grams of meat, my bread weight should be 10% of 900, which is 90 grams. My kefir weight is 16% of 900. Do 900 times 0.16 on your calculator and voila, it's 144 grams. A quick word about the onion and celery weight. As long as they sum up to 20% and as long as you have more onion than celery, it's all good. For garlic, just use your best judgment. You can use as much or as little as you want. Salt and ground meat mixture is a topic that I get a lot of questions about, so I think we should discuss it. You can certainly cook a tiny piece of your mixture in a pan or in a microwave and taste it for salt. But it could take many tries to get it right. I find it a lot faster and easier to weigh the salt. Ground meat dishes taste best when the amount of salt is 1% of the weight of all the ingredients. But be careful not to include the weight of the bread since the bread is already salted. Luckily, you don't need to do all these calculations because I did them for you. 1% of all the ingredients minus the bread is 1.44% of the weight of meat. So how would you figure out the salt amount for your amount of meat? Here's how. Imagine that instead of 900 grams of meat, you have 1200 grams of meat. Multiply 1200 by 0 0.0144 and you'll get the salt weight, which is this. But grams are very small, so it's completely safe to round that to 17 grams. The only thing I'll warn you about is if you are making a very small portion and the amount of salt that you need is less than 10 grams, you should measure that on a fine precision scale since a normal kitchen scale is not accurate with small measurements. If this is all a bit overwhelming, just use two pounds of meat and you won't have to do any math. Here are more thought-provoking culinary videos for you to check out and if you are ever in the Boston area, maybe I'll see you in one of my classes.